ESCRS 2021. The History of Modern Refractive Surgery. A Tale of Two Centuries. Written by Patrick I. Condon. Narrated by Sally Cronin. You may ask, what is refractive surgery? In short, it is surgery on the eye carried out by an ophthalmic surgeon, which changes the refractive power of the eye, enabling the patient to see without glasses. Because refractive surgery dates back almost 200 years, with so many advances in recent times, it is virtually impossible to cover the full scope of its complete development in such a short period of time. Possibly the oldest refractive procedure that we have knowledge of is the surgical correction of astigmatism with two individual accounts, one from Shiots and the other from Faber in the mid-1800s, in which large amounts of astigmatism were corrected by a single grey knife incision. Towards the end of the century, Lanz described his meticulous experimental animal studies which produced the basic principles for the correction of astigmatism, resulting in the theory of the coupling effect, and which kick-started the present practice of straight and arcuate relaxing keratotomies for the correction of astigmatism. The reversal of myopia was initially discovered anecdotally by Sato in Japan in 1936, in a young man with a severe corneal injury, but it wasn't until 1974 that Fyodorov in Russia developed the operation of radiokeratotomy, which involved 16 radiocorneal incisions using a metal blade. This was called the Russian operation and was quickly followed by its introduction in the US and Europe with its introduction by him in Dublin in 1980 in which the author of this presentation participated. Fyodorov was also the founder of the Moscow Institute in which he introduced a unique, highly efficient conveyor belt operating theatre design involving a series of operating tables rotating to different surgeons for varying aspects of the RK procedures and which maximise the increased turnover of surgical procedures. In 1982, George Waring, in conjunction with the FDA, set up a prospective evaluation of radial keratotomy study called PERC. It was a controlled multicenter clinical trial which involved 435 patients with myopia, between minus 2 to minus 8 diopters of short-sightedness, over a 10-year period, which involved eight incisions with a diamond knife, ultrasound corneal thickness measurements to determine blade length, the diameter of the central corneal area being determined by the preoperative degree of myopia. In 1993, the published results revealed that an overshoot of treatment to long-sightedness of plus one diopter or more resulted in many patients being precipitated into presbyopia and having to wear glasses for reading. With the emerging development of laser refractive surgery, incisional radial keratotomy procedures were finally abandoned in 1993. Following the publication in 1949 of his thesis on the law of corneal thickness and the development of his original corneal microkeratome, Jose Ignacio Barrica in Bogota developed the technique of keratomalusis, which involved the removal of a cornea disc at a depth of 300 microns from the patient eye, which was then frozen and transferred to a cryolade, which removed 110 microns from the posterior surface and which was then replaced on the patient's eye, thereby altering the optical focus of the eye with a reduction of myopia. There followed a period where freeze-dried or lyophilized donor corneal buttons from eye banks were used to correct higher degrees of refractive errors and to regularize keratoconic corneas. This procedure, known as epikeratoplasty, was developed by doctors Kaufman, Werblin, and MacDonald at the University of Louisiana in U.S., but was later discontinued. Krumike's non-freeze technique, using the BKS system, in which the corneal button is slowly removed from the patient's cornea with a Baraka microkeratome, as seen in the left video. The piece of cornea, or button, is then transferred to a special holder designed by Krumike called the GTS system, 
which supports the cornea in the upturned position, which is then followed by the refractive removal of tissue with the same microkeratome designed to correct the patient's refractive error when replaced back on the eye. Eczema laser technology first hit the headlines in 1970 when Russian physicists in Moscow produced a laser beam of light with a wavelength of 172 nanometers. This was further developed in the US using different gases by the US Naval Research Laboratory for military purposes and in the years between 1980 and 1983, Srinivasan et al. in New York produced a laser ultraviolet light beam with a wavelength of 193 nanometers which they found suitable for removal of 0.00025 mm of surface tissue from the cornea for a single eczema pulse without a thermal reaction. Once this was discovered, it did not take long before Stephen Trockel, an ophthalmologist with a background in physics and engineering in the University of Columbia, New York, combined with Professor John Marshall at the Institute of Ophthalmology, London, who reported a revolutionary new technique of photoablation to remove tissue from the cornea with an eczema laser to treat myopia. The amount of tissue removed with each laser pulse had to be calculated, and this was worked out by Munalin and his colleagues and presented in 1988 as the Munalin formula. While Professor Theo Seiler in Germany had already started to do PRK for myopia, Dr. Marguerite MacDonald was the first person in the US to carry out the procedure there in 1988. In the video on the left, you can view a recording by Lucio Burato in Milan on 25th of October 1989 of the first procedure in which a microkeratome was used to remove a corneal disc of tissue from the patient's eye with treatment of the piece of tissue with laser. A Barraquer microkeratome is used to make the initial cut with the microkeratome progressing across the eye after which the piece of cornea is removed from the microkeratome. This piece of tissue is then placed in a petri dish and removed from the operating room to a summit eczema laser. Where the laser performed the refractive ablation on the posterior surface of the cap for the required correction for the patient. Here you can see very clearly the piece of patient's cornea showing the excised area of treatment on the posterior surface of the disc before replacing it back on the patient's eye. However, almost at the same time, Professor Yanis Palikaris in Greece, shown here with George Krumike and myself, reported the technique of hinging back the cornea flap and combining it with an application of PRK, eczema laser, in the stromal bed of a rabbit's cornea. It was shortly afterwards that this procedure was initially called laser in situ and eventually became known as LASIK. In response to the technical and surgical difficulties associated with the Barracare microkeratome, Ruiz developed his own automated instrument in the form of the Automated Corneal Shaper, or ACS, which had the ability to make the superficial exposure cut in the cornea as well as the refractive deeper cut in the stromal bed of the cornea. It also incorporated a hinge into the corneal flap to prevent free cap loss. This procedure was called Automated Laminar Keratoplasty, or ALK. In an effort to acquaint surgeons with the difficulties in using the microkeratome and the new instruments being developed, the European Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery organized courses and wet laboratories for members to acquaint themselves in the technology and skills with the formation of the European Laminar Keratoplasty Users Group in 1994. This was followed by a period during which the standards of microkeratome technology improved dramatically with the introduction of newer instrument designs. ALK with the ACS, 
became a very versatile procedure and was used for a variety of refractive and non-reflective indications. It was even used to correct hyperopia up to plus 5 diopters with a relaxing horizontal cut at a depth of between 53% and 74% of total depth and found to be superior to other forms of hyperopia correction. In the following year, many investigators worldwide followed the Palicaris hinge technique with laser treatment applied to the stromal bed of the patient's cornea. In the US, Slade initiated the flap and zap operation with the ACS in 1993. In the same year, Condon and O'Keefe were the first in Ireland and the UK using a summit laser in Dublin, as seen here on the right video, applying the laser beam to the stromal cornea while protecting the hinge of the corneal flap. In this video by Lucio Barato in 2016, the microkeratome has been replaced by the fem to second laser in the cutting of the corneal flap. After separation of the flap from the stromal bed, not shown in the video, the microscope is refocused to facilitate the deeper refractive treatment in the patient's cornea using the same technology. In 1999, Juno and colleagues described the use of femtosecond lasers for corneal refractive surgery. Femtosecond lasers are solid-state infrared lasers operating at 1,053 nanometers and are characterized by ultrafast short pulses minimizing collateral tissue damage. The cutting process is driven by mechanical forces, bubbles, and is limited by focal spot size as shown on the right. For the subsequent 10 years, both US and European manufacturers continue to refine the use of these ultrafast solid-state laser oscillators for ophthalmology. The therapeutic use of the fem to second laser soon found a place for itself in penetrating and deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty and the accurate placement within the cornea at the required depth for the safe insertion of intracorneal rings for advanced keratoconus. From a refractive point of view, besides its use as a replacement for eczema laser in LASIK, femtosecond was also found to be extremely successful for intracorneal lenticule removal as in flex and smile refractive procedures. Intracorneal rings, or intacts as they were originally called, were first used in additive refractive surgery for low myopia, for which they were approved by the FDA in 1999. However, it did not take long before the therapeutic effect found in regularizing the cornea in keratoconus was recognized, with the late Professor Joseph Colan in Bordeaux, who originally established the first reference center for keratoconus in the year 2000. In 1995, Professor Theo Seiler invented the concept of corneal cross-linking to strengthen the cornea by a stiffening process. This was followed three years later by the first clinical use of this technology to strengthen the cornea in keratoconus patients and was termed corneal cross-linking. In 2010, rapid corneal cross-linking was used to combine with LASIK in keratoconus patients. On the right is an example of a 49-year-old with advanced keratoconus totally intolerant to the wearing of contact lens. Six months after cross-linking and an intracorneal ring insertion, the remarkable improvement shown on topography was associated with the ability to re-wear the contact lens due to a considerable reduction in the degree of astigmatism associated with significant flattening of the cornea. Clear lens extraction was first carried out by Fukala in 1887 using a decision and washout technique followed by needling of the residual posterior capsule as a secondary procedure. Because of the serious complications of inflammation and retinal detachment, the procedure was discontinued in 1912. Vasella, in 1987, reintroduced the operation using phaco emulsification and small incision surgery, but discontinued the procedure due to peer pressure. Coalen and Barraker reported 7% to 8% retinal detachment in highly myopic patients, 
but others such as Lee, Chris, Ferrara and Horgan, Condon and Beatty reported approximately 2% detachments in similar groups of myopic eyes. Most of the early anterior chamber intraocular lens implants had footplate endothelial touch, resulting in endothelial cell loss, with decompensation of the cornea necessitating removal. With the FDA approval of the ChoiceMark 8 single-piece PMMA design, some manufacturers started to incorporate biodegradable materials into similarly designed lenses which precipitated endothelial cell loss, requiring their removal. Following several unsuccessful attempts by Bake Off with different designs and materials, the concept of angle-supported intraocular lens implants was finally abandoned in favour of iris fixation. Fyodorov's admiration for Ridley gave him the idea of developing a phakic posterior chamber IOL. So much so that with his colleague Fouez, he developed a silicone foldable IOL in 1978, which had a collar stud design fixated on the pupil called RSK1. In 1986, a new collagen plate haptic IOL was developed, the RSK3, which was zonal fibre supported. In 1993, Starr took over the company, and early investigators Scorpic, Pedanda et al. and Saldivar modified the lens in relation to subluxation, pupil block glaucoma, endothelial cell loss, and lens opacification, while sizing difficulties were improved with new UBM and laser scanning technology. The ultrasound biometric image shows an ideally placed ciliary sulcus fixated vision intraocular contact lens implant. The principle of iris fixation of an intraocular lens implant was originated by Jan Vorst, as seen here with his wife Annette, and who was instrumental in starting the instrument company Oftec in Holland. The lobster claw concept started with the original Taxila intraocular lens, which was introduced to the Aravind Clinic in India in 1979 for the correction of aphakia following cataract extraction. In 1986, Paul Fechner, in Germany, inserted the first artisan phakic IOL for high myopia, followed in 1993 and 1997 with lenses for the correction of hypermetropia and astigmatism. In 2003, the very sized TM and soft foldable artisan lenses were introduced by AMO. The significantly reduced cell counts over a prolonged period of time postoperatively made this feature the most suitable lens for their use in younger patients. The availability of this technology to correct high myopia, astigmatism and high hyperopia resulting from successful cataract surgery in children has been particularly valuable in relation to the treatment of potential amblyopia, where in the past the wearing of contact lenses combined with occlusion was not always reliable. The successful use of artisan and artiflex iris clip lenses in children has been well documented by Professor Michael O'Keefe, and his team at the Department of Paediatric Surgery in Dublin's Children's Hospital, with their results reported extensively in the literature and more recently in Barato and Packard's book on the history of modern cataract surgery. It is hard to believe that it has taken 200 years for refractive surgery to reach the level it is today. I wonder if this caption applied to children with congenital cataract could also apply to the history of refractive surgery. Nevertheless, despite its tortuous development over two centuries, refractive surgery has eventually left a gifted legacy to ophthalmology. I wish to convey my thanks to Boris Maliugin for all the documentation regarding the incredible contribution made by Professor Fyodorov and the Institute in Moscow. To the late Jan Vorst for his amazing influence and contributions to every aspect of today's ophthalmology clinical practice. To Ayanis Paligaris and Jorg Krumike for their help and contribution to me personally in the field of lamellar, refractive surgery and keratoplasty. To Professor Michael O'Keefe, who pioneered the development of laser refractive surgery and intraocular lens implantation in children in Ireland. To Lou Toberato and Richard Packard for their incredible recently published books entitled History of Refractive Surgery 
and History and Evolution of Modern Cataract Surgery, which were extremely helpful. And lastly, to my long-standing ESCRS colleagues for this award for giving the ESCRS 2021 Heritage Lecture in Amsterdam. <laughs>